Hi, I'm Andrea Donsky, and you are watching Morphus. Today, we have back Dr. Teresa Irwin, a board-certified female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgeon. We're going to be talking about hysterectomies. That's coming up right now. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Teresa. I'm so happy to have you back talking about hysterectomies. Thank you. I'm very, very pleased to be back, Andrea. I had a lot of fun last time, so thank you. Me too. All right. So what I'd like to do is I'd love you to define what is a hysterectomy and what are the different types that we can have? Sure. Well, hysterectomy is simply removing the uterus. And most hysterectomies it involves removing the uterus and the cervix. It becomes very confusing because a lot of women think automatically that they're going to go into menopause. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the organ that produces the hormones are the ovaries not the uterus. The uterus is the culprit of making us bleed and have pain and that sort of thing. Not that the ovaries can't make us have pain, but um, hysterectomy simply is uterus plus or minus the cervix. Uh, most of the time it's gonna be both. Now, when you hear people saying total hysterectomy, then that's when you include the tubes and ovaries. And that's when the hormones will change. A partial, you know, in, in layman's terms is gonna be the uterus so total would be the uterus ovaries and tubes. Okay. And how do you decide, like, I guess it would depend if there was some, you know, an issue of certain things that are going on there to decide whether or not you would remove the ovaries with it, right? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. So there's, there's a lot of factors to take into account. Uh, as a general rule, we, we want to preserve hormonal function, the natural hormone function, which is very contrary to what it was when I first started practice 20 years ago. So when I started practicing, if you were 40, you didn't even get a choice. Mm -hmm. And not being, I'm being extreme, you did, but it was pretty much, you need to take your ovaries out because you're gonna get cancer. Right. And what we've discovered over the years is, is it was such a disservice to do that for women to, to castrate them. And then they end up having lots of other issues occur, which we can talk about later. Uh, so in saying that, okay, average age of menopause is about 51 and a half plus or minus two years. Mm -hmm. So if they're near that age, um, you can counsel or we counsel our patients saying, okay, here are the pluses and minuses on whether or not to keep your ovaries. And this is for someone that has no pathology on the ovaries. We're going right. to pretend that they're going in for hysterectomy because they have either heavy periods or adenomyosis, endometriosis, conditions that, that uh, would be indicated to do hysterectomy. So the counseling basically is going to be, if your ovaries look fine, Okay. And you're not having pain, you know, specifically in those like lateral sides, so right or the left, then um, you, I, I let them know that at the age of 70, one in 70 women will end up having um, ovarian cancer. Hmm. So definitely if they're closer to 70, then I start to um, probably encourage them a little bit more to take their ovaries out. But prior to that time, I give them that quote. And then I say, if you keep your ovaries, so you, the risk goes up as you get older, that's a risk factor age. And not only that, unfortunately, it's found at a later stage. It's difficult to find early on. Mm. But, and, and the thing of it is, is part of it is because the symptoms don't come until it's already advanced. And the, the most common symptom is, guess what do you think gets the most common symptom? You're talking ovarian cancer? Uh -huh. I would say uh, like bloating and yes. some kind of digestive bloating. issue. Who doesn't have bloating? Right. You know, if Very we common, go in yeah. and, and uh, someone comes in with bloating, well, and you know, I usually will order an ultrasound unless it's specifically related to every time I'm about to have a period, I'm bloated or whenever I eat these certain foods, I get bloated. Uh, outside of those two, then, I, then I'll order an ultrasound, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to say, oh, they have cancer. You know what I mean? So the, unfortunately, it's very nonspecific. Hmm. Therefore, it is going to be found later. Okay, what are the, so what if you have the ovaries removed? What are the drawbacks there? Then you go into menopause like that versus when you go through natural menopause, it tends to be a little bit more gradual. It's not as uh, extreme, typically. Right. And those symptoms are going to be the usual that you think about. So hot flashes and night sweats and mood swings. Mood swings can be include depression, anxiety, irritability, um, vaginal dryness, decreased libido, orgasmic dysfunction, and weight gain. Mm. So there's a common misconception that having a hysterectomy is going to lead to weight gain. And it is possible, but not with a hysterectomy by itself. 
it's going to be if the ovaries are removed. And that, that doesn't go, you know, it doesn't mean everyone does. It just, you might have a little more propensity toward that. And why is that when, with the removal of the ovaries? Because it, it's such a drastic shutdown. And part of it is your ovaries produce testosterone. Mm-hmm. And testosterone tend to keep the fat to muscle ratio in a positive way. In other words, muscle to fat is a better uh, mm-hmm. ratio than it was, the, than it would be without it. Mm, uh, interesting. Uh, yeah. There we go. I said it right. <laughs> so, Interesting. So, so basically, just to repeat that, so it makes sense. So, you're saying there's a co- common misconception with hysterectomies in general that if you get one, it will lead to weight gain, but it's more so if you have your ovaries removed at the same time. Yeah, plus or minus hysterectomy. Hmm. So, essentially, it's taking out the ovaries. Hmm. Now, if you just take out the ovaries, is that considered a hysterectomy as well, and then leaving the no. cervix? No. Okay. No. No, because you're still leaving the uterus and the cervix if you're only okay. doing the ovaries. Okay, so that wouldn't be considered that. Now, right. no, is there... I'm sorry, just to clarify something. So hist, H-Y-S-T, is like from the word, it's derived from the word hysterical, mm, right? right? And uh, so the history on that is that when women went through menopause, they often put them in insane asylums because they called it hysteria. Of, of menopause, it's terrible, and so so that I think that's where the association ended up over the years coming about is that they're like hysterical. His hysterectomy means that you know they're uh, losing they're losing their hormones, but it's not the case. But anyway, a little bit of history there. Uh, just to be clear, you do hysterectomies on a regular basis. I do. Okay. And how long have you been practicing for? Twenty and a half years. Wow. Okay. So if somebody came to you and they had said, Dr. Teresa, I really want to get, you know, I want to have a hysterectomy. Let's assume there was no pathology. What you mentioned before, like heavy bleeding, or there were some other issues, pain. What are some other reasons that somebody might want to have a hysterectomy other than the pathology part? Well, really? um, Okay. So if there is a family history of uterine and or ovarian and or breast cancer uh, and colon cancer. So there's there are certain mm-hmm. syndromes and genetic uh, disease states, or if they're carriers of certain genetic genes, uh, then, then it may be encouraged to really not do the hysterectomy so much, but take the ovaries out. Mm. Like the BRCA genes you're referring to? That's, that's one of them, yeah. And then there's a, a syndrome called Lynch syndrome, okay. where it's it's the uterus. Now, in that case, you do want to take out the uterus, but it's associated with colon cancer and some other things. Okay, interesting. So in those cases, it's prophylactic and rather than actually doing it for pathology. Now, other than going and let's say we're, let's say we're talking about someone now who has a full hysterectomy with the hysterectomy with the ovaries. Other than putting them into full menopause, are there any other side effects that would come with it? Well, there is a little bit more increased risk of prolapse when you've had a hysterectomy, but it's not a huge amount. And uh, so if that's something, if someone is worried that that's going to happen, um, you have to look at both the benefits, the pluses and the minuses on, okay, why am I getting it done? And what are my other risk factors? So if you have, you know, family history, you're obese, you smoke, you had 10 pound babies, mm. you, you know, you have all these risk factors for prolapse, uh, then that may be something to, to say, okay, well, let me, let me see if I can make it to menopause and, and uh, treat my bleeding with birth control pills or some other method, right? Mm. Uh, but don't let that really be the, the reason to not do it because uh, it's, it's a low risk. Uh, There has to be other things going on as well. Now, there was for a while there where we were encouraging doing what you call super cervical hysterectomies, and that's where you keep the cervix. Uh, So you only take off the uterus, but you leave the cervix. So what are the pluses and minuses on that? Okay. It was thought for a while that if you retained your cervix, that you would not develop prolapse because it's near the area where the ligaments that support the uterus are located. But it was found to be equivocal. In other words, it, it didn't make that much of a difference. Right. And then there was another school of thought, and this was actually when I was going through training and then shortly after that it changed, but uh, that, that your sexual function 
would um, be impaired by right. taking out the cervix. Okay. And that also was found not to be um, completely correct. Unless a woman found pleasure if her cervix was being hit. And most women don't find pleasure in that. It would but be painful, some, right? Yeah, there's some who do. Okay. Uh, outside of that, it really didn't make that much of a difference. And now you still have a cervix. You still have a risk of cervical cancer, albeit right. it's, it's, you know, not, not as high as when you're having sex with a bunch of different partners, because that's what a main risk factor for cervical cancer. Right. Uh, or early uh, having sex at an early age um, and STD history. The other thing is... <clears throat> You'll have about 12%, 10, 12% of women will end up having continued periods with, by keeping your cervix. So that's, okay. you know, if you're having, the reason you're having hysterectomies for heavy periods, then yeah. uh, that's you're not gonna take that necessarily the, the best thing. Now, there are, you know, we have all, I always like to tell my patients that whenever I go into surgery, I say surgery is like a box of chocolates. You're, you never know what you're going to get. Right. And, and in this case, what I mean by that <laughs> is that the bladder often, especially if you had any other kind of abdominal surgery, especially C-section, right. ha, there's a much greater risk that it's going to have scar tissue and, and be stuck to the uterus and, and especially the cervix because that's lower where the bladder is, right? And in those cases where there's going to be a, a very high risk of injuring the bladder, although if you have a bladder injury, that's probably the, the best kind of injury to have. I know it sounds weird to say that, but that's the easiest one to fix and the one that you rarely have any problems with later on if you find it at the time of surgery. But if there's a concern that that may happen, then the surgeon may choose to keep the cervix in place. And mm -hmm. the, the time that it'll happen the most is when they have endometriosis, or uh, some other reason to have a lot of scar tissue, multiple C-sections, et cetera. But right. the most common time that we'll leave it, that where the woman didn't want it necessarily, is uh, at the time of an emergency right. uh, hysterectomy, right. when, when we deliver. Uh, so basically she's had a baby, whether it's vaginal or C-section, and she's bleeding profusely. Hmm. If you've done all the other things that you do, the medicines, the injections, the extra suturing, and it just does not stop, right. you're left with nothing else you know, to save your life. It's a really scary, dangerous procedure because the vessels are huge. Right. So they bleed a lot. I mean, it's the worst time to do a hysterectomy. Hmm. But you have, sometimes you have no choice. Anyway, in that case, you want to minimize bleeding. So you want to hurry up, get that uterus out and just leave the cervix, you know? So that's... Hmm. And that's when they're thrown into medical... I think the term is medical menopause, right? Um, well, no, because they still have the ovaries. Okay, right. Medical menopause would be removal of the ovaries. But the ovaries as well. It's very confusing. <laughs> no, but I understand what the ovaries is well. Right. So the so if the ovaries are left in and you're just you're removing the uterus and the cervix, can they still have future children or they can't anymore because they don't have a uterus and a cervix anymore, right? Right, they can't. Now, if they preserve their eggs, right? They did cryotherapy, they had the egg retrieval. Well, first okay. they stimulate them, stimulate their eggs, and then uh, go in with an ultrasound needle and take out the uh, eggs, freeze them for future use. So in that case, those eggs can be used, but they have to be implanted into somebody else. else Interesting. Users. Okay. So yeah, they can deserve it. So, so yes, she cannot carry the baby anymore. Um, but they yes. still have, her eggs are still viable if they froze it before, mm -hmm. I understand. One thing I wanted to add about uh, taking the ovaries out is, is about fallopian tubes. Mm. So uh, when did it, I'd say probably 10 years ago, and, and don't quote me on that, but around that time, we started to take everybody's tubes out if they're going to have a hysterectomy. So one thing I want to mention about uh, when you take out the ovaries now, um, or the uterus, okay, we recommend if you want to retain your ovaries, uh, which is totally fine, is definitely take out these fallopian tubes here. And the reason being is because they serve one purpose, and that is to capture the egg from the ovary. Mm -hmm. And of course, it travels through the uh, tube, and then it's fertilized here, right? Okay. Because the sperm comes in through here, fertilizes the egg, and then implants. Okay. okay. So the reason to take out the tubes if you're going to do a hysterectomy is because that's the only purpose they serve. So if you have a hysterectomy, you can't have babies, right? Mm -hmm, right. Anymore. Therefore, get rid of them. Why? 
because the most common ovarian cancer begins in the fallopian tube. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yes. So they serve no purpose except to potentially cause cancer at that point in time. Wow. Now, uh, but, but that's different for ovaries. So I always tell them, okay, here's the deal with ovaries. You know, you get menopause symptoms or potential uh, ovarian cancer. But with the tubes, there is no benefit. Hmm. Now, if you really want me to leave them there, I will. And I have had nobody ever tell me they wanted me to leave them. So <laughs> Right. So what about if somebody wanted to get, so their, their cervix and their uterus removed and mm -hmm. then leave their ovaries in? And then and let's say they're in their early 50s. But like you said, around 70, that's where the, it's the one in 70 stat I think you gave. Is mm -hmm. there a surgery and is it a very intensive surgery? Is it the same type of surgery that a, right, the, the hysterectomy was initially to go in and remove the ovaries? Because by that time they're in menopause and their ovaries are no longer functional. So what is that procedure? And is that something you recommend? Well, okay. So now you're saying they have cancer or they- no. They don't, don't they just move. want to do it as a preventative. Okay. Well, uh, it's going to be questionable as to whether or not insurance will cover it because there's okay. not a reason you need You need a medical indication at that point. Okay. So let's say I'm, they have a medical indication. They have a cyst, right? Okay. Yeah. So it, it depends on the surgeon's skill and what they're most comfortable doing. And nowadays, most of the new surgeons coming out are robotically trained. Mm. And that by far, in my opinion, is, is the best because okay. recovery is going to be much better in terms of pain, in terms of interoperatively, right. less risk of complications and bleeding. Right. right. So, um, but it can be done with an open incision. It can be done with just the straight sticks. We call this, we call laparoscopy straight sticks. Yeah, the laparoscopy. They don't, they don't move like the robot, you know, has the wrist motion. Right, and right. The straight sticks don't. And then, it, or it can be done vaginally, but that's really rare to do it vaginally if they're not already going in for a hysterectomy. Okay. And that's much, much more, um, it's, it's almost, it's not unheard of, but it's much less heard of. Right. So it would be a, some form of abdominal surgery, whether it's trans, like open surgery, laparoscopy, or robotic. Understood. So, Dr. Teresa, I'd love to move on to preparing someone who is about to have a hysterectomy. So, what are some tips and tricks that you can give somebody to, whether it's questions to ask their doctor, whether it's preparation before they go to the hospital, and then also once they leave the hospital? And I know that's a lot of questions, it's loaded, but just any type of um, tips that someone who is listening, who is about to have one, can walk away with. Sure. So let, let, we'll, we'll start in order, right? Okay. So in terms of prep, you want to optimize your health. And, you know, that, that kind of goes for, that's really the answer for everything just about, right? Mm, yeah. But especially when you're going to have surgery because you want to heal well. And that means reduce car, uh, simple carbohydrates. And that's going to be all the white. So the breads, pastas, crackers, cookies, tortillas, chips, potatoes, candies, cookies, et cetera. And you want to um, uh, eat more of the white protein. So fish, chicken, turkey, pork, egg whites, tofu, depending on quinoa if you're a vegetarian or vegan. And then uh, lots and lots and lots of dark green vegetables because they have lots of antioxidants and that helps with- um, And they're anti-inflammatory too. So mm -hmm. bringing that, any type of inflammation, minimizing yep. that, yeah. Yep. And then of course, protein uh, that I mentioned earlier is, is helpful for healing. Right. And, and why do I want you to reduce carbs? Why, why sugar? Because bacteria loves sugar. Right. So therefore you want to reduce that potential. Uh, you know, if you're, if you have issues with weight and I know that sometimes you only have a certain amount of time before surgery, but if you uh, carry extra weight, trying to be a little bit better about exercising and just optimize yourself, take your supplements. Uh, and that's a whole other Conversation. Talk. I won't, yeah. I won't go over that because that's a lot. Yeah. Uh, and then if you're a smoker, whew, stop. <laughs> there's there's no better, you know, I, unfortunately not everyone's gonna do that. And it's right. hard. And I don't, you know, I don't blame a lot of these folks that they this is what they grew up with. This is all they knew. You know, no, they, they had commercials, you know, making it very fashionable and, and all that sort of thing. So it's it's hard for a lot of them. But even if they cut down any little adjustment that's in, in, in a reduction mode is best. So that's the, the before. Now, depending on your surgeon, 
They may ask you to do a bowel prep for, but that's just going to be the day before typically. And what's, what's the reason to do it? Do you know why? I, and when you say bowel prep, you're talking about like eliminating your bowel. So, so like the same off. thing like you would do for like a colonoscopy kind of thing. Is that what yeah. you're talking about? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So the, uh, the reason to do it is because, and, and not everyone does it. I tend to uh, a lot more because of the fact that most of the time I'm doing something on the rectum or near there, you know, right. rectus seal really not on the actual rectum, but the rectus seal, which is an, is a protrusion into the vagina from right. the rectum. And uh, so, so initially we did a lot of it because in case there was an injury, mm-hmm. you don't want all the poop to get into the operative field and cause contamination. Right. And, infection. Right. and um, in my case, I'm not worried so much about that as I am that, that, you know, sometimes I have to place my finger rectally to get elevate and move tissues. And I, I it's, it's difficult when the poop's there because then I got to change my gloves a million times and it just causes more contamination. Right. So it boils down to infection, okay. infection prevention. Right. So uh, you may or may not need to do that. Uh, some, some surgeons do it across the board. Others will do it based upon the patient. So if they have um, a history of endometriosis and they're worried about a lot of scar tissue and they might there might be scar tissue in the bowel and things of that nature, then they're more likely to get that. Okay, uh, okay so that's that's for the preparatory. Then uh, when you're in the hospital, it depends if it's gonna be outpatient versus you're gonna be there. But wearing comfortable clothing, uh, making sure that you have all your history. So many times people don't know what surgeries they've had and when it was done, you know, cause you're gonna have to repeat it a million times. So right. if you want to type it out and have it ready, then that saves you your breath and uh, anguish for you if you can't remember everything, right? Yeah. And, and then it makes it easier for, for everyone else. So if you can't memorize all your history, that's okay. Just write it down. Mm-hmm. Uh, be, be responsible for your own health and uh, know that. about so it means it means knowing it, and then of course trying to keep it uh, in good health. Um, and then uh, nowadays with COVID, sometimes you can't have somebody there with you. Mm-hmm. But uh, if point. you can, you can plan for that, right? And having them do their overnight back, and then wear loose clothing because if you have incisions on your belly or other places, then um, it's uncomfortable to have stuff that's that's you know tight on you. Uh, and there's a lot of other little things, but I, you know, we, we have the nurses take care of most of it. So aftercare now for me, because I do so much, uh, vaginal, uh, surgery, I, I tend to have a whole cocktail recipe stuff of, of things to, to have at home, you know, like the donut, for example, you know, kind of like when you had babies, right? Essentially the same. Uh, so having a donut, having ice packs or having uh, frozen peas, things that will be comfortable. Oh, one other thing, make sure that you pick up your medicines before surgery. If, if your surgeon prescribes them before, if they don't, you just request it. You know, we, when they come in for their pre-op visit, that means where we give them all their instructions, what they can, can't do after work, afterwards and beforehand. And also to sign consents, we give them, we uh, send their prescription so they can have everything ready and they don't have to worry about having to pick it up after and you're in pain, you know, having to go get your medicine is just not ideal. So having everything ready, if you can prepare everything. And then, for example, I have a lot of women asking me, okay, I have a two-story house. Can I go up the stairs? Mm-hmm. Well, most of the time, yes, but try to consolidate it. So if you can have things all ready for wherever you're going to be most at, then that's also helpful. That's great advice, actually, especially around the medicine and doing everything in adv- as much as you can in yeah. advance. So that pre- you know prevents you from having to do it after, especially if you don't have someone to help you. So yeah. that's actually, it's great advice. And I love that you're talking about nutrition too. So you're talking about eating those anti-inflammatory foods, those healing foods. So I, I think that's great. Kudos to you. I, I love hearing that. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's a shame, but in medical school, they don't teach us a whole lot about nutrition. They do some, but if uh, not really um, as intense as I think it should be. Hmm. But you know, shoot, there's just so much to learn. It's kind of kind of have to pick. What about for women who have their ovaries removed? So now they're going to be thrown into menopause. What are some things that you go over with them before? Do you explain to them what's going to happen to them? Is there are there any things that they can do to help minimize? Because a friend of mine 
she had a hysterectomy about a year ago and she wasn't really told that she was going to, they had her, she, they removed her ovaries, but she wasn't really prepared or told that she was going to go into menopause. So what are some things that you do to prepare your patient so that it is, you know, obviously surgery is a big deal and you're going through a lot of trauma, but what are some things that can help them at least from a preparation standpoint? Sure. So it depends on their age. So if they're 70 years old or, you know, even 60, I would say probably 60 and above, uh, I'll, I will tell them, okay, so if we take your ovaries out, that means menopause right away, but you've already been in menopause for 10 years. And then I ask them, what were your symptoms when you went through it? And they're like, oh, I didn't have anything. You know, it was fine. I had a hot flash here and there. I don't really talk a whole lot about it. And I say, well, then you're probably going to be fine. Probably. Right. Or if they're already on hormones, I said, well, it, you're probably going to be fine. Can there be a, a change? Yeah, sometimes there, there might be a, a, an adjustment to require it afterward, but usually not in terms of their hormones. Uh, so it's more so I would say for the, the perimenopausal women or ones that are just going through it, that, that you definitely want to talk about more. And I already had that discussion anyway, even before the, that pre-op phase, but what, what, what do I tell them? Okay, so we talked about what those symptoms are, right? And uh, the, some of the things, so the, the biggest complaints are gonna be hot flashes and night sweats. And really it just, it, it goes down, it boils down to how you dress. Um, layering your clothing is a great way to take care of it. Uh, obviously it doesn't always help in places that, that's really hot. And to warn your, your partner, you know, male or female, that if they sleep with you, uh, you may freeze them out. Just warn them, here's an extra blanket for you, but I'm gonna have my fan, I'm gonna have my air conditioning <laughs> pie, and you know, have comfortable, cool clothing. Don't wear really cotton, you know, thick clothes and stuff like that to bed. Uh, sometimes you can even just put a wet cloth around your neck uh, at the beginning of the night just to cool you down a bit. Drink, you know, cold ice water. Uh, stay away from really hot liquids and soups and things of that nature because those tend to be, you know, tend to make you more hot. Also spicy and, and alcohol, those are also tr triggers for heat. So, but you know, there's always uh, hormones. So if you're comfortable with doing hormone therapy, in my opinion, I think they're fine in most women, not everyone, but I think they're fine in most women. I just counsel on what those potential risks are gonna be. And I have a pretty exhaustive consent that goes over, you know, the numbers in terms of you know, 30 per 10,000 wound years will develop a clot and that could cause a stroke. Or, I don't remember, it's 30 or 37. So for the, the various ones, for breast cancer, strokes, heart attacks, and um, blood clots. Um, and then uh, other things that uh, are helpful, even though you, when you exercise, it tends to make you warm, it really does help the psyche. So this is more to treat the mental part of it uh, because you just feel better overall. And nutrition is huge. There are certain foods that just drag you down and carbs are notorious for that. And, you know, intermittent fasting is one of the best ways, whether or not you need to lose weight. Um, at the minimum of doing 12 hours, 16 hours is better, but don't, don't, don't make it so that uh, you, you're setting yourself up for failure. So for example, I have my vision board and I have all my goals. And um, I used to be really, really good about um, sticking to my uh, fasting, but I, I've, I've sort of gotten a little weak in that department. So I, I don't want to set myself up for failure and say, ah, forget it. So what I do, what I've written on mine is, okay, I'm going to fast for 12 hours most days of the week and two days I will do 16 hours. And heck, if I do more than that, great. But then I don't feel like, God, don't you have any willpower? You, you know, this, that, and the other, which we're often so, we, we're so prone to doing that. <laughs> and we've got to give ourselves some slack. So, okay, uh, diet, uh, layering, oh, we've talked about foods, beverages, uh, vaginal dryness. There's some great products out there uh, that work for that. Um, one of them that, that I like that's, that's good for sex is going to be slippery stuff. Um, that's a very good one that doesn't have a lot of chemicals in it. Fem Pharma is a, is a company that makes a vaginal lubricant that has hyaluronidase. I mean, that's 
that was uh, brilliant in coming up with that. You know, because we all know that's what we use to plump up our faces or whatever. You that's know. hyaluronic acid, right? Yeah, hyaluronic yeah. acid. Yeah, Hy hyaluronic acid is the reverse. All right. the reverse. Okay. Yeah. I actually, I want to. I have a question regarding the hormones that you were saying because, as you were saying, I was like, that would probably would it be a good idea whether it's bioidentical or HRT or whatever it is that if somebody was going to have their ovaries removed to start that prior to getting the hysterectomy, so that way when they have the hysterectomy, they've kicked in and they, they, would that minimize their symptoms of the hot flashes yeah. and the night sweats? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, maybe like a week before or even you know when they get home. But just so they have them, because then they might say they might have the hysterectomy, not have the symptoms, right? Mm. Now and the other, if, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, and even if maybe it's not something they want to do long term, but it's something they want to do for a few months, or you know, I don't know what's the healing. The, is it a, a year or six months of recovery after? Like, so even if they do it a certain amount of time for after, and then stop or ease their way off it, it could still be very big after the surgery in order to minimize that kind of like that huge difference, right? Yeah, yeah, correct. Interesting. So yeah, for temporary, and actually, about one third of women will uh, never go on hormones. And not, and this doesn't, this has nothing to do with his or, or taking the ovaries out. It just has to do with all women across the board. Right. One third don't ever go on them. One third, um, uh, go on them for a period of time, you know, two years, five years, whatever, or what, like what you're saying, if it's that just that short period of surgery, post-op surgery time, it could be six months. Uh, and then one third will stay on them forever. Mm. And I'm one of those, I'm in that last group. Hmm. Unless somebody yanks them out of me, I'm taking them forever. <laughs> I, I would love to do a, another interview with you about HRT because I feel like it's something that I would love to learn more about and whether it's BHRT, which is the bioidentical or hormone replacement therapy and the Women's Health Initiative. Like there's so much so much information out there that I think it would be important for me because I'm a, I'm the natural girl, right? So for me, I'm very much about doing things without it, but I know lately I'm, I'm opening up my mind and speaking to people like yourself. Like, I really just want to understand it. Like, I know there's a genetic component and I know that there's like, you're saying like, so but I would love to park it and save it for another interview because yeah. I do think yeah. it's such an important topic and one that uh, I think a lot of women would benefit from understanding better. So I want to add something about that. And, and, and I'll repeat it at a, a future interview, but this is important because I didn't mention it earlier yeah. uh, when we were talking about what would happen if you take your ovaries out. So my dad, my sweet dad, he died almost a year ago in April mm -hmm. and he broke his hip. And then within three months he was dead. And, and basically he, he spiraled down. He went into this acute dementia and um, because in his mind, he, he knew he could walk he kept, you know, dislocating it over and over and over, anesthesia, just so many things. He finally just starved himself to death, to death. Okay, so I've been doing a lot of research on Alzheimer's, even though he didn't have Alzheimer's. Mm -hmm. And dementia, you know, because it was such a quick onset, it's hard to say really what happened completely, but it doesn't matter. His mom had Alzheimer's. And uh, so I've been doing a lot of research because now I'm at risk for it, right? Mm -hmm. And there's a fabulous book called The End of Alzheimer's. And essentially this physician is saying that, you know, soon we're gonna get it to where it's not gonna, it's gonna be like HIV. It's whoever has it, hmm. it's got it, they've got it under control so it doesn't get out of hand. Wow. Uh, because Alzheimer's is such, it's a prolonged disease and it it's creates such havoc with the family, especially. And of course, the poor person who is not their fault, they don't, you know, you, we always gotta remember that that person that has Alzheimer's, the way that they behave now is not them. Mm -hmm. And so many times we can easily forget that. Um, my, my husband is a family medicine doctor and so he deals with a lot of this. And that's the first thing he tells families is, mm -hmm. please remember them as they are now. So mm -hmm. what I, my point being is that, um, the, in, in his book, uh, he talks very much about how there's four different types of Alzheimer's and a couple, I don't know if it's two or three that has to do with low hormone levels and that contributes more to it. Um, so there is, so there's cognitive decline and, and this is more in the functional medicine side. So you, you know, really kind of sort of your, um, arena, the more natural side. And he's saying, no, you've got to optimize them. The other thing too is even on the Western studies, so he's kind of more, he combines kind of Western Eastern, which is, which is very much the way I am. Uh, but in, the, in terms of the Western medicine uh, with hormones, they, they 
I have, have noticed that women that have hysterectomies and the ovaries are removed tend to have more of a cognitive decline, but if they get placed on hormones, that's going to occur less so. so. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah. I know that I had read some, um, some research on that, that the cognitive decline, I guess they're more prone to it. If you ha- do have a full on hysterectomy. So that is interesting so that the hormones can help prevent that. You know, yeah, this is a great conversation and one that I definitely want to have. I know we deviated, but I just wanted to mention that's such an important love it. thing. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. No, I think that's really important. So thank you for that. You, you, I, I want to talk about the bladder for a second. You were mentioning, or you alluded to earlier that, you know, the bladder is the easy fix, but, you know, sometimes that the bladder can be affected when you're doing the surgery. Is there, are, is someone who has a hysterectomy, should they be preparing for prevention, I guess, when it comes to getting, let's say, UTIs after hysterectomy? Is there any type of research or correlation between having a hysterectomy and a UTI afterwards? Not necessarily, okay. unless, unless they also have a uh, bladder prolapse, right? Okay. And, and the reason for the, the uh, bladder prolapse doing that, well, okay, so let me, let me back, back up. So if she's having a hysterectomy because she has prolapse of the uterus, right, then um, it, it would be the reverse because if now everything's going to get lifted, the uterus gets removed, the bladder gets lifted, you know, if it's, if it's also dropped, Right. then she should be less likely to have UTIs because okay. now you don't have uh, the, now you're able to empty better because things are up instead of where the bladder is below the urethra and it's hard to go up against gravity to empty the bladder. So in that case, it's not, not um, it's going to be the reverse. So it should not be a greater risk unless there's something else going on. Okay. So by itself, if that's the only, only thing, then it shouldn't be. Perfect. Thank you for that. And then if, um, you know, I know you and I both love Utiva, the product Utiva, which has the cranberries in it. Mm-hmm. So if there is any issues with UTIs, that's a product that I highly recommend and think it's a great product. Oh, God, for sure. Because I have so many patients. The thing is, is women in general, in general, no matter your age, are so much more prone to getting UTIs. It's so common. And uh, it's, it's, it can be really, you know, I mean, we don't think of it as being something that's debilitating, yeah. but as, especially, I mean, even in my younger patient population, but especially when women get older, it is, it is debilitating because uh, it is known to affect uh, cognition if that bacteria doesn't get treated and gets into your blood system. So, yeah, so it important. is really uh, something that's, uh, can be, can be deadly. I mean, I hate to be so extreme, but it's true. It's true. My friend was telling me a story that her grandmother lived with them and she was experiencing symptoms of dementia. And she said it was a UTI and they yeah. fixed her UTI and her, you know, her cognition came back. So yes, no, I, and it's one of those things that is so preventable too. Like you can now with the at-home test kits, right? So you can text, you can test you can test if you have a UTI by yourself. You can text. I'm like, I have text on the brain, but you could test whether or not you have one really easily by peeing on a stick, literally. So I think, um, I, you know, to me, that's a, uh, it's a great point. And the, the, the fact that there is that correlation, especially for women in perimenopause and menopause, that the incidence goes up even more. So, um, something, an easy fix and I love easy solutions. So to me, that's a, that's a great thing. So thank you for that. Is there so, anything? Oh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. I do want to mention about, um, bladder infections in, in menopause, perimenopause, because so the bladder, the urethra and the vagina all have estrogen receptors, right? And so if you now have a hysterectomy with the ovaries and they're removed, then you lose the estrogen now binding to those receptors, meaning that the tissue is going to become very weak. Uh, it atrophies. It's then it's more prone to micro tears. So guess what? UTIs. So take Utiva if you're going to have your ovaries removed. Okay. That's good to know. Is there anything that we didn't talk about today when it comes to hysterectomy that you think would be really beneficial for our listeners? Well, the, not about hysterectomy, but I want to add on the Utiva and, the, and, and also the test strips okay. because um, I think that that's a great thing to do because women don't go and, and get checked many times or they go when it's too late. Uh, but uh, in saying that, if it shows that there is that it, that there's a high probability of being an infection, go and get a culture. So now you've done mm-hmm. a dip, and now it says, "Ooh, you know, this is probably a UTI." Go get a culture because it may be that 
that uh, you're treating the wrong bacteria is usually the most common thing, but it could be that there's only a small amount of bacteria, so it's not really UTI, but something else is going on. So there you go. So it's nice, it's a nice screen. It's nice that you can test and say, oh, there's a high probability there's a pro that it's a UTI and, and vice versa, or there's a low probability it's, it's a UTI. So something else is going on. Hmm. That's good advice. Thank you for that. Dr. Teresa, I always love talking to you because you are such a wealth of information. And how could people find out more about you if they want to, you know, I, and you see patients, obviously you're a practicing vaginecologist, <laughs> like your son came up with. I love the term. It's awesome. So how could people find you? Well, I am either under Dr. Teresa Irwin or under the vaginecologist uh, for all the social medias. And, and they're, you know, they're different according to which social media, but either way, my full name or the vaginecologist, you'll find uh, those. And I have a website that is called the vaginecologist, lots of materials in there for uh, helping you, helping educate you on things about the vagina and, and surrounding structures. <laughs> And um, so hopefully you'll put those links. I will definitely. We're going to put the links below so people can access them really easily and follow Dr. Irwin on TikTok because she's having a lot of fun. So, uh, and awesome. we're going to, yeah. And, and we're going <laughs> to do one together or three or five or something. We are, we're going to, we're going to, now I just started TikTok too. I was telling Dr. Irwin before we came on that I'm having so much fun on TikTok. So, uh, we are definitely going to collaborate on TikTok. So that's awesome. Well, thank you as always for doing the show. We appreciate you so much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thank y'all for listening.